During the past few years, airport security <laughs> has been tighter than any other time in history. And yet, just a few years ago, despite all that security, I was one of the few people allowed to bring a sharp metal object on an airplane anytime I wanted. This is a pair of surgical wire cutters. For a year and a half, I commuted from Newark, New Jersey to Orlando. And for several months, I took these with me wherever I went. I'd had major reconstructive jaw surgery, during which the bottom half of my face was basically taken apart and put back together. I think correctly. <laughs> to keep the pieces in place while they healed up, my jaw was wired shut. Around the same time, I began commuting to Orlando because I had a freelance writing job here, and I started flying down every couple of weeks. You've been through airport security. Imagine four times a month explaining to the TSA why you need to bring these on board with you. My jaw is wired shut. If anything happens to me, somebody might need to cut my mouth open. Now, I have to tell you, you can communicate with your jaw wired shut. But when you're bound and constrained like that, you start using a lot of visual aids and saying only the things that are very, very important. Most of the time, you spend locked inside your own head. Good for quiet contemplation, bad for interaction. And a little bit terrifying because you have no voice and that makes you feel very, very isolated. Well, eventually the wires came off. The freelance job turned into a full-time job and my wife Rebecca and I moved to Orlando. And that was a bit of a tough move because we really didn't know anyone here. No friends, no family. You know, talk about isolation. Having no friends, being far from home was really the most isolating thing of all. So at a certain point, I had a really good idea. I joined Toastmasters. <laughs> yeah. You're out there, I know it. <laughs> it's a club that helps you learn to become a competent public speaker. You learn how to write a speech and you learn how to deliver one. Now I figured I already knew how to write a speech because for many years I had worked as a speechwriter to executives at Fortune 500 companies. But I really didn't know how to deliver one. I hadn't had much experience in public speaking and I thought, well this might help me get out there and meet people in my newly adopted city and at the same time, it might help me exercise my newly rebuilt jaw, like having speech therapy in public. And it worked. I met some wonderful people, many of whom became friends, some of whom are here today. I learned how to get up and deliver a speech. And somewhat to my surprise, I learned a little bit about how to write a speech. Back when I worked for major corporations, I used to write kind of big, fancy speeches, full of big words and convoluted sentences. Well, guess what? Those things turn out to be very hard to deliver. You know, I'd be, I'd be up there trying to articulate my own literary language, and pretty soon I'd be panting. I, I really learned the value of brevity and simplicity. I, I learned a lot, and I learned the same way that everyone in the club learns, through 10 basic assignments. Organize your speech, research your topic, use body language. And eventually I got to assignment number eight. Getting comfortable with visual aids. <laughs> now, 
As a matter of fact, I had never given a speech with slides up to that point. And in fact, I often counseled executives and corporate leaders. I was telling Chris Castro about this. Really, I, I would say you shouldn't use slides at all. Because, you know, let's face it, nothing is more boring than some joker up there reading his entire speech off his own bullet points. You've seen that speech, right? And you've asked yourself the same question we all do. When is it going to end? So, so I researched my topic. And I found a book by Gar Reynolds. Gar's a pioneer of a new style of PowerPoint in which the visuals support and enlarge the meaning of the speech. He's an advocate of simplicity. He says that restrictions and limitations actually fuel the creative process. And in chapter two of his book, right there on page 41, was something that literally changed my life. A sidebar article on something called Pachakasha. Pachakasha is a global presentation phenomenon invented by Mark Dytham and Astrid Klein. Mark and Astrid are two expatriate architects working in Tokyo. And they wanted to give architects a forum for sharing their ideas, but Mark was worried. Give an architect a microphone, he said, and you could be stuck for hours. <laughs> so they invented Pachakasha. Now, I've heard people in the lobby, people have trouble with the word. It's a Japanese word. It means chatter or chit-chat. It's one of those words that sounds like the thing it's describing. Chit-chat, Pachakasha. <laughs> but in fact, it's really the opposite of chit-chat because it's very focused and very specific. In fact, Pachakasha has only two rules. 20 PowerPoint slides, 20 seconds per slide. Presentation runs automatically, and you tell your story in sync with the visuals. And the result takes exactly six minutes and 40 seconds. No starting over, no turning back. Remember I told you that with your jaw wired shut, you only say the things that are very, very important? Well, that's how restrictions and limitations affect communication. With only 20 slides, and only 20 seconds per slide, Pachakasha forces you to make your points quickly and powerfully. And what's interesting is somehow the limitations of the format actually bring out the best people have to offer. PowerPoint becomes a vehicle for self-expression. PowerPoint becomes an art form. And like Mark says, all that's left in people's presentations is the poetry. Well, the format caught on. Soon, Mark and Astrid were hosting Pachaksha nights for crowds numbering in the hundreds. Soon after that, it spread beyond Tokyo. And before long, Pachaksha nights were being held in major cities all over the world, everywhere from Amsterdam to Atlanta, from Venice to Vienna. Wired Magazine did an article about it, and they said, quote, you say what you need to say in six minutes and 40 seconds of perfectly matched words and visuals and sit the hell down. The result combines business meeting and poetry slam and turns corporate cliche into beat the clock performance art. So one Friday night, I headed down to Tampa for my first Pachaksha night. And I have to tell you, it was a magical evening. 200 of the coolest people I had ever seen in one room until today. <laughs> and I said to myself, wow, if I could do that here, I might get to meet the coolest people in Orlando. So I wrote to Mark and Astrid, and I asked for permission to start a local event. And before I even knew it, I was addressing Tokyo via video as the host of the newest city in their global network, Pachakasha, Orlando. So we held our first Pachakasha night about two years ago this month. The audience was mostly my neighbors and <laughs> coworkers. Nobody really liked the funky little club we held it in. We had problems with the audiovisual, which is not a good thing when your evening is built around PowerPoint. <laughs> and yet, this too was a magical evening. You could feel that it would get much, much bigger. And, and in fact, that's what's happened. We've held Pachacha Night since then, once every couple of months. We've added, since we started, food trucks, live entertainment, cash bar. We're having our next Pachacha Night, in fact, in about two weeks. Along the way, we've had great media attention from The Sentinel, The Weekly, Orlando Magazine, and this year, 
something really exciting, an award from the Downtown Orlando Partnership. And what was sweet about that was the award was for making a contribution to the city's arts and cultural scene, and that was really the goal from the beginning. Best of all, each time the audience has grown bigger and more enthusiastic. And I have a theory about why that is. I think it's because in today's world, with so much time spent watching TV online, with so much time spent isolated, we're hungry to communicate face to face and really connect with each other. You know, once upon a time, it didn't take that much to have yourself a wonderful evening, <laughs> right? All you needed was a full moon, some congenial companions, and a bottle of whiskey to pass around, right? Well, you can think of Pachakshanite as kind of a high-tech version of that, only instead of a full moon, a campfire, and a bottle of whiskey, we have a projector, a screen, and a cash bar. <laughs> but the basics are the same. Sitting down to hear some interesting people get up and tell anecdotes, stories, and maybe one or two tall tales. You know, there's a, there's a misconception about communications. A lot of people think that if you just conveyed information, you've communicated. Events like Pachakshi Night and events like TED suggest something very different. Communication is about forging a connection with other people. And in hosting Pachakshi Night, I've been forging that connection for myself. I've met people from every walk of life. They've talked about everything from urban planning to balloon art, from special effects makeup to dealing with the IRS. People working to make a difference. People helping to make Orlando a better and more vibrant place to live. People with different personal styles, different stories to tell, but each one with only 20 slides, only 20 seconds per slide, and nothing left in their presentations but the poetry. Chaksha Orlando became bigger and more successful than I ever could have expected. But in organizing it, I discovered something else that I didn't expect at all. In putting these events together, in talking and in listening to people, in hearing them share their stories, I discovered I wasn't locked inside my own head, a man with no voice, cut off and isolated in a strange city. I discovered I was part of a community connected to literally thousands of people all over the world. And at the same time, I discovered that I was deeply connected to this city and its people. I discovered that I was home. Thank you.